Tonight, we show you something smooth, streamlined, functional, and fast. <laughs> but that's enough about me. <laughs> I'd done a TV series with Stanley Baxter, brilliant character comedian called On the Bright Side. Stanley then toured in a stage version, On the Brighter Side. And I was in my hometown of Leeds, and this show arrived. Stanley and I had a reunion. And talking of a member of the cast, Stanley said to me, watch out for the fat one. He's going to make it. That was Ronnie Barker. Your game, milady? <laughs> What's that bulge in your pocket? I beg your pardon. <laughs> he must have been buried in a pauper's grave, but the pauper rejected, so he had to have one of his own. I don't think I've ever met an actor who was also a born comedian. Ronnie Barker was. In the divorce court today, an 85-year-old farmer divorced his 17-year-old wife because he couldn't keep his hands off her. He's now sacked all his hands and bought a combine harness. <laughs> Ronnie Barker was a character actor who had such a flair for comedy. He was two-faced. He was an actor and a comedian, all in the one body. You're nuts, my lord. <laughs> On my list, greengrocers and opticians, you see? Oh, I see, yes. <laughs> I can read women like a book. What system do you use? Uh, Braille. <laughs> I'd been working with Ronnie Corbett in nightclubs, and one night David Frost turned up, invited me and Ronnie for a drink. As a result, Ronnie Corbett went into the TV show The Frost Report, and I became a Frost writer. These moments that change your life. And then Ronnie Barker was incorporated into The Frost Report, and the chemistry between those two was immediate. Sacred animal the cow is to a Hindu. I believe. Now, take your Arab, on the other hand. He sets great store by a repast of sheep's eyeballs. <laughs> it's like the king's banquet to an Arab of sheep's eyeballs. Please, I'm eating. Chinese eat pussycats. <laughs> Ronnie Barker was hired for The Frost Report, which was a satirical follow-on from uh, David Frost's previous show, That Was The Week That Was. It was it was a show that took a wry look at the headlines, but also played on just more general sketches. So they were quite quickly, Ronnie Corbett and Ronnie Barker were paired up together, partly because of their height. So that was where they started to gel, these two comics. That was where people started to see them. <laughs> One of the most immaculately cast sketches was the three classes sketch. I look up to him because he is upper class, but I look down on him because he is lower class. I am middle class. I know my place. They were on the Frost Report, surrounded by kind of uh, Oxbridge comedians, if you like. And, yes. And they were the two non-university. That's right. So they had this in common, didn't they? The sense that we haven't come up through That's this. right. We're not part of that lot. Yeah. They had their own definite slot. I still look up to him, because although I have money, I am vulgar. <laughs> <laughs> but I am not as vulgar as him. So I still look down on him. The favourite sketch is, you know, the class sketch. Though oddly enough, you tend to think of that as a John Cleese sketch because he's so tall in it, and uh, and Ronnie Corbett is so short. But uh, Ronnie Barker is a, a central uh, part of that. What a learning ground, you know. I mean, if if you're gathering experience for your own show, um, there really wasn't any better place to learn about television and and learn that kind of craft. I get a feeling of inferiority from him, but a feeling of superiority over him. I get a pain in the back of my neck. <laughs> the two Ronnies worked with David Frost and everything. We all went to ITV, and then it faded and they were dropped by ITV. But there was a, a big do and awards or something, and the cameras broke down, and the two Ronnies started improvising and fooling around on the stage. In the audience, I think Paul Fox from the BBC, maybe Bill Cotton and 
Michael Grade was there, was like, and everybody saw this happening. And I think it was Paul Fox who looked and said, we could use these two, they should have their own series, which is what happened. They went back to the BBC, the two Ronnies was born. Good evening. It's wonderful to be back with you once again, isn't it, Ronnie? Indeed it is. And in a packed programme tonight, we shall be meeting the owner of a chicken which has been fed on Smarties only for the past two months and today laid the first Rubik egg. <laughs> I was a founder member of the two Ronnies, having been in the Frost Report and everything, and Ronnie Barker had this very orderly, structured mind. Very early on, he started planning the format of the show. It just worked fantastically well, almost from the word go, and it was a show that kind of had its different elements every week, but they were always exactly the same. There's always some, you know, jokes at the beginning, a couple of sketches they did together, Ronnie Corbett sitting in his chair, Ronnie Barker with an elaborate wordplay thing, and then a big musical thing to finish. Having done the first programme, they had no, they saw no reason to change that for, you know, series in, series out, year in, year out. What they sort of did was just throw in a bit of everything. But it works because it's like a whole evening's entertainment in three quarters of an hour. <laughs> Talking of women, have you seen the new maid in the bar? Yes, I have. I've seen better legs on a piano. <laughs> and with a piano, you get one extra. <laughs> Supposing I want some crumpet at tea time. <laughs> well, supposing I do. <laughs> what I do after five o'clock is my own business. Tony Barker was not a comedian. He, his ambition was never to be a comedian as we understand it now. His first ambition was to be Laurence Olivier. He saw Laurence Olivier's Henry V when he was at school, and he then played truant again and again to go and see the film. That's what he wanted. He went into repertory theatre, and it was during there that he did his first comedy role and he found that he loved the laughter and he decided at that point i don't want to do drama or tragedy anymore it's comedy all the way so he became a great comic actor what i like because i feel the same myself is that he was an actor doing comedy and he wasn't putting on a persona as a, a stand-up he was playing the different character in all the different sketches Ronnie Barker was very uncomfortable appearing as himself. He once turned down a very prestigious award because he didn't like speaking as himself. He didn't want to make the acceptance speech. He could only appear in public in character. There was something about the, the character that kept him safe, I think, from failure. Ronnie Barker, definitely a comic actor rather than a comedian. Almost always, he's playing a part. He's playing somebody. I am the professor of this. Uh, welcome to, in this sketch, I'm doing that. He became adept at dressing up and inhabiting different characters throughout his comic career. I'm from the Ministry of Sex Equality. <laughs> I'm here tonight to explain the situation man to man. <laughs> or as we have to say now, person to person. <laughs> My name is Mr. Stroke Mrs. Barker. <laughs> but I don't advise any of you to try it. Ronnie had a very firm definition of himself. He had to play the character. We had a, a charity night at the Players Music Hall in London and somebody dropped out, it was a Sunday night do, and somebody said to me, you know Ronnie Barker, who was in those days a neighbour. And uh, I rang Ron and said, uh, do you want to do this on this particular Sunday? He said, what would I do? And I said, uh, you had an old monologue, Dangerous Dan McGrew, you used to do, and that would fit. He said, oh, yeah, yeah. So on the night, I hadn't met him before the show. So I banged my gavel, Ronnie Barker, and he came on. Hair parted in the middle, no glasses and a moustache that you couldn't see beyond the third row. Oh, and went so well that night, stormed it and went off. And I was with him afterwards, I said, what's the moustache and the hair? He said, it's not me then. Yeah. Not me, he said, I can smell the spirit gum. I've stuck a moustache on my upper lip. It was fascinating. Yeah, so he was. He wanted to, he felt safer. <coughs> in safer character, hiding yes. Hiding behind the character, yeah. what have you. It's interesting that the two Ronnies, that Ronnie Corbett was quite quiet and serious when you were with him, and Ronnie Barker, I think it was an, uh, a basic shyness in a way. 
Yeah. He always seemed to want, seemed compelled to say something funny. So he thought perhaps this is what I ought to be doing. Yes, this is what I ought to, they'll be expecting this of right. me, so I better okay. say something funny, you know. Yeah. The news at Ton Sketch yes. Yes. is very hard to describe, but watched, it's absolutely brilliant. It's essentially Ronnie Barker about to read the news, and as he does so, there's a phone on his desk, it rings, and he says to the audience... It appears that uh, we've had a slight problem with the news. Our new electronic typewriter has developed a minor fault. It's been typing O's instead of E's. Uh, I hope you'll bear with us. <clears throat> <laughs> Good evening. <laughs> Horro is the now's a ton. <laughs> it's a sort of a spoonerism, it's a pun. There's nothing obviously funny about it. You can't say, you know, there's nothing... He doesn't end up with a rude word, he doesn't... It's just the ludicrousness of him sort of beavering on and trying to make it work and absolutely not, not giving way. In cow gardens today, a lady was frightened by a Scotsman with a wooden log. <laughs> Every now and again, he gets another phone call from the controller trying to tell him something else, but he just perseveres with all these, you know, all these ridiculous words. In Wa Worcesterminster today, Mr Wadgwood Bond spoke of his plan to nationalise the stool industry. <laughs> and Mr Donis Holy discussed his plans for a further tax on bots and botting shops. <laughs> I'm the Minister of Cuts. I represent the National Institute of Cutting Known Economic Resources, Double Urgent, or knickers to you. <laughs> now, what does all this mean? Ronnie Barker was, I say this affectionately, a control freak. He was a born editor, he was a good writer. He'd virtually direct the films when they were on location. And Ronnie Corbett would just hand it over to him. Little Ron was off on the golf course somewhere. Ronnie Barker was sitting in editing when they were putting a show together. And Cruz trusted him because he had a, a sure touch with editing and filming, which is very rare in uh, a performer, but he had it. Members of the RAF will still be up there flying, although a much greater degree of skill will be demanded of them, as there won't be any aeroplanes. <laughs> I think Ronnie Barker was always very interested in the process of how the programme was made, because the problem for writing for television is that there are a lot of stages between the writing and the finished product. And as a writer, you, you sort of begin to realise that you need some element of control over that. So I can very easily understand that he started to want to make sure that the script was done as he envisaged it. Now, this ticket here is British Rail's new stay away day. How does it work? Well, you travel to a secret destination and we close down the line before you come back. <laughs> Their roles changed all the time. They were great admirers of Morecambe and Wise, but they weren't a double act. They were just two men who worked well together and had the things they did outside the show. But those two knew when they got together, it was going to work, and they worked hard at it, making it work. And in every sketch, it alternates. Sometimes the sketch is led by Ronnie Corbett, sometimes it's dominated by Ronnie Barker. They had a wonderful understanding of sharing out the workload all the time. And they had to have complete agreement with material. If they both didn't agree with the sketch, they didn't do it. They both had to say yes. Good morning, Miss Prendergast, you're early. Ah, <laughs> uh, good morning. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, good morning, sir. Good morning. Um, could I have um, two pounds of potatoes, please? <laughs> Ronnie Corbett and Ronnie Barker complemented each other so well because they were physically so different. Ronnie Corbett was, you know, short, slight. Ronnie Barker was huge. And so having them sit or even stand side by side was funny. 
but they had the same sensibility. So again, there was not a straight man and a funny man. They both had their own routines. They both had their own bits that they did. And then when they came together, they would share the laughs quite often. Would, uh, would you care for a cup of tea? I just made one. That's very nice, yes. yes. Now, tell me, um, what, what, uh, what seems to be the trouble? And what was so clever was he and um, Courtney Corbett, they were so different, and yet it was lovely to see them together. You know, it was like a a big boy with a little boy, you know, not just physically, they're mixing together as, as good, good blokes. As it happens, it all came together uh, pretty well um, when, when it, they came up with the idea of performing together and they can't have imagined it was going to go on for such a long time. Now, here we are. Try this nice red pair on. There we are. Let me have those. Thank you. Try those. Have a look at those. There are. Look in the hand mirror, see what you think. <laughs> Exactly what's your job, Ellen? Well, the same job as I had for 20 years, wasn't it? You see, yes. I always work with, um... With pride? No, with, um... <laughs> Within reason? No, no. With, uh, <laughs> with your overcoat on? No. <laughs> with Harry Hawkins, oh, didn't Harry, I? Oh, Harry, Harry, Harry. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to be a comedy writer quite heavily because of the two Ronnies. Because they used lots of writers, and these names would come up at the end. And I used to think, how do you get to be one of, one of those? The through line with the two Ronnies that's interesting is that because they came from the Frost Report, they brought with them a lot of the writers from that group. All of the cast of Monty Python, all the Monty Pythons, wrote for the two Ronnies. They also had writers like Spike Milligan and David Nobbs, and all of that wrapped up with Barry Cryer. It was just the most spectacular arrangement of writers television's almost ever seen. Ronnie Barker also wrote sketches. He wrote his sketches under a false name, Gerald Wiley. Uh, and that was because he didn't want anyone to look at the sketch and say, oh, Ronnie Barker's written it, we're gonna have to put it on air. He wanted it to be judged on its merits, judged on its humor. I've been in that situation myself when you're working on shows and you're, and you're the performer, you're just one of the writers as well. The, the other writers may think, you're preferring your own material. So I can perfectly understand the idea, well, if I put the material in for my own benefit, I will understand whether it's any good or not, and I'll get a an objective view from everybody else. We soon learned about this strange reclusive figure. We knew his agent called Gerald Wiley, who would submit sketches. But he wrote, Gerald Wiley wrote a, a hospital waiting room sketch, which was strongly starring Ronnie Corbett. Ronnie Barker just came on at the end as a doctor or something. Yeah. And Ronnie Corbett liked it so much he said, uh, I would like to buy this and do it on the stage. This message was sent through the mysterious Wiley's agent. The message came back that Gerald Wiley was a big fan of Ronnie Corbett. He could have the sketch. So Ronnie Corbett, to his credit, got a beautiful set of cut glass and everything in a beautiful box crate to be sent to Gerald Wiley. And we all turned up at the old studios in Wembley uh, and Ronnie Corbett walked in to reception and there was his box with the cut glass in. He said, what's going on? The word went round, Gerald Wiley is in the building. Oh my God, it's like Agatha Christie now, <laughs> what's going on? A further message, Gerald Wiley would like you to join him in the Funk Se Yuan Chinese restaurant across the road after the show if you're available. Oh boy, now this is great. So we all go over to the Chinese restaurant and Ronnie Barker suddenly stood up and he said, it was me. And we all went, oh, stop it, we've all done that one. And a few minutes went by and he sort of banged on the table. He stood up and said, I'm sorry, it was me. And I stood up and raised a glass and said, the toast is nobody loves a smart ass. Once Gerald Wiley got known as a name, he had another pseudonym and then another pseudonym. So he was always sending in material with new names. I particularly liked the fact that he, what happened in the end was people did get to know how good he was. And so to our first contender. Good evening, your name please. Uh, good evening. <laughs> your first heat, your chosen subject was answering questions before they were asked. This time you have chosen to answer the question before last each time, is that correct? Charlie Smithers. <laughs> 
And your time starts now. What is paleontology? Yes, absolutely correct. <laughs> My own particular favourite is uh, the mastermind sketch written by David Renwick, where Ronnie Corbett's answering the question before. He's out of sequence all the way through. Oh, these sketches are just models of what you can do with a sketch. Complete the quotation, to be or not to be? They're both the same. <laughs> what is Bernard Manning famous for? That is the question. <laughs> who is the present Archbishop of Canterbury? He is a fat man who tells blue jokes. <laughs> what do people kneel on in church? The Right Reverend Robert Runcie. <laughs> the Mastermind sketch, it's a classic. It starts with Ronnie Barker opening Mastermind with the classic music and the theme in the chair, and then Ronnie Corbett's in the in the chair, and he's opted to answer the previous question. So every single answer that he gives is answering two questions ago. So, for instance, he uh, said, what would you use such and such a chemical for? And uh, the answer is paint stripper, but he has to leave that to the next question. And the next question is, what did Toulouse-Lautrec do? And so he says, uh, paint strippers. <laughs> Correct. Each Who one becomes a gag. Each one becomes uh, a joke. And it, but they play it deadpan, straight-faced, all the way through. Yes, it's completely right. And at no point do they break and, you know, they don't, no point do they acknowledge that it's funny. What would you use a ripcord to pull open? Large flies. <laughs> Correct. What sort of a person lived in Bedlam? A parachute. <laughs> Correct. What is a jockstrap? A nutcase. <laughs> to set it in context, in the 1970s, Pretty much every show did a mastermind sketch. It was a staple of comedy. But the Two Rollies mastermind sketch is the cleverest uh, and the most consistently funny. It is actually, I think, one of the best sketches ever written, personally. I think it's a model sketch. Complete the following quotation. I started, so I'll finish. Complete the following quotation about Mrs. Thatcher. Her heart may be in the right place, but her. Charlie's aunt. Correct. <laughs> Ices, please. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it's Fletcher, isn't it? That's right, yeah, that's right, Mr. Barclough. Yeah. Christian name? Norman Stanley. Date of birth? 2232. Uh, next of kin? My beloved Isabel, the little woman. <laughs> yeah, not that she's so little, mind you. I said to her the other day, you know, Isabel, I should never get over you. I'll have to get up and go around. <laughs> he went into the television series by Dick Clement and Ian Frenet called Porridge. He played Norman Stanley Fletcher, who was um, a recidivist criminal. Um, he would, you know, he would be in, in jail, and he'd go out and he'd do a crime and come back in again. It was unbelievably authentic and a hit right from the very start. I think most people would agree his, his finest performances in uh, Porridge, it was just a perfect part, a perfect situation uh, for him. Look, if I don't mind my saying so, Mr Mackay, leave it off, will you? Since when has logic had anything to do with job allocation round here, eh? Do you know who made our raspberry blancmange last week? Riggs, and he's in here for poisoning. <laughs> One of the highlights for me, Ronnie Barker, was Porridge, because he, he became a really good, strong character. What I liked about him was he played it really quite straight in many ways, and which made it twice as funny. Ronnie Barker's performance in it is astonishing, really, to take all those aspects of what is quite a complex character. He's very crafty, he's sometimes hugely dishonest, he steals things, he's quite capable of handling himself physically, but he's very astute, he gets on with everybody, and he's sort of worldly wise and funny. <laughs> and that's really quite an achievement. A father's place at home, and it with his kids, giving them affection, parental guidance. I got three, you know. Yeah, I know. 14, 19 and 24. Quite a gap between each. Circumstances dictated that. 
He said it's the only show he's ever done where he didn't want to change a line, a syllable. Right. Ian Lafrenne and Dick Clement, it was just spot on. Yeah. And of course, when I watched the very first one, I thought, here he comes, no glasses, changes his hair colour. Yeah. Norman, Norman Stanley Fletcher. Yeah. It, you had to look twice almost. He didn't look particularly like Ronnie Barker yeah. when he first entered. I heard an enormous compliment to it once. My friend Ronnie Golden, who I do gigs with, he's got a rock and roll outfit, and they played a gig in a prison. And they were really having a good time with this prison audience. And then he said, halfway through our gig, they started drifting out, walking out on us, and he was baffled. And they finished, and he said to a warder or somebody who worked there, what, what happened? And he said, porridge was on. <laughs> Who stole all them nails for you from carpentry crassers so you could hang your pin-ups on the wall? And who gave you half his mother's homemade shortbread? Homemade shortbread, yeah. I used that to bang the nails in with. <laughs> in a porridge, bizarrely, it starts with the judge passing sentence on Fletcher. But the voice of the judge is, is Ronnie Barker as well, so <laughs> he obviously liked doing everything on shows. There were 20 episodes of porridge, but it's still seen as one of these epoch-defining comedies. As so often, things done well always look easy. And um, it's not easy. What he's doing in that show is really not easy. What you play for? Big stakes? Yeah, if we can nick any out of meat safe, yeah. <laughs> Ronnie Barker was our neighbour here and was often requested to open local fates and charity functions and so on. And he had a big hang-up. He said, nobody wants to see me. He'd usually send a check, so they were very pleased about that. But he once broke his rule. We had the big Kodak centre here, and uh, I saw he was opening their fate. So I went along, there was quite a crowd. He was sitting at a table signing autographs. So I thought, game on. <laughs> And I got a bit of paper. I think I literally rubbed it on the floor, a disgusting bit of dirty paper. <laughs> and I took my glasses off and put my collar up. And I shoved this bit of paper at him and said, Could you put some marjorie, please? And he went, hardly looked up and gave it to me. And I thought, Oh, joke's <laughs> over, it didn't work. <laughs> and I looked at the bit of paper and it said, Piss off, crier, I'm busy. <laughs> When people think about the two Ronnies, the first sketch I think that comes to mind is the Four Candles sketch, and Ronnie Barker wrote that. Four Candles. <laughs> Four Candles. Ronnie Barker walks into his general goods store, and Ronnie Corbett is behind the counter. And they, immediately he starts mis misrepresenting what he's supposed to be b buying. It ends up when he's asked for four candles, and Corbett gives him four candles. Here you are. Four candles. No, four candles. Well, there you are, four candles. Lays them out and he says, no, no, no. No, four candles. <laughs> candles for forks. It is so clever and it has spun out so well that it's become one of their most famous gags. Ronnie Barker will always be known for his verbal sketches. Um, so the ones where he mispronounces things and gets words muddled up and are some of the funniest things I've seen. Of course, the fork, fork handle one is, is one that gets funnier every time I see it. It is famously based on a real letter and the best joke in it, which is four candles, is not Ronnie Barker's joke. It's, a, it's, it's something that was sent in to him by a viewer uh, to whom it had actually happened. Saw tips. Saw tips. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want, ointment or something like that? <laughs> he very generously handed over the sketch yeah. to Ronnie Corbett. Yeah. Ronnie Barker's the straight man in that yeah. sketch, giving the feed lines. Yeah. Well, he was a generous performer, wasn't oh, he? Oh, yes. Who wasn't seeking... He would always share. And pumps, foot pumps, come on. <laughs> foot pumps. Foot pumps. Foot pumps. I think what we enjoy in that sketch is the deadpan stupidity of, 
of uh, Ronnie Barker and Ronnie Corbett just, you know, trying to get it right, but, uh, but not at any point just actually sort of saying, well, just explain the way you say it. It's a great sketch and it's a Ronnie Barker sketch. <laughs> No pumps for your feet, brown pump size nine. <laughs>sketch featuring Mr. Ronnie Corbett who's always being let down by people otherwise he'd never get off the bus. <laughs> hello, hello Simon, hello Gerald here. Yeah? Um, hello Doris, Doris it's me Walter. <laughs> How are you old man? Um, all right thanks. <laughs> Listen, Simon, I had to ring you up to find out how you got on with that fabulous new girl last night. Uh, not too bad. There were one or two things I couldn't quite get hold of. <laughs> Crossline sketch is an absolute classic of miscommunication, which Barker loved to create. And it's basically two people in, in a public phone booth in a, in a hotel lobby. And there's, he's playing... Uh, a slight old Rue, a sort of sporty type, and he's on the phone to a man who has obviously just had a fling with a very interesting young lady, and he wants to know all the details. And um, just in the next booth is Ronnie Corbett, who is talking to his wife about what the shopping he's got to get in Sainsbury's. And they start talking at cross-purposes. So what happens is you hear, as if the two of them are talking, you hear their exchanges and their interplay. So when Ronnie Barker asks his friend about, you know, what's she wearing, at which point you hear Ronnie Corbett saying, Bloomers too large. <laughs> so, you know, the, the humour is in the very, very innocent and the very, very lewd. Well, she sounds a right little raver. I don't know how she had the energy. Uh, she said the milkman hadn't been round yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would explain it, of course, yeah. What did you do? I had to get sterilised. <laughs> Good God. <laughs> and he loved the comedic potential of the delivery of language. It's just howlingly funny because when he starts saying, well, you know, um, how much was it? And Ronnie Corbett says, well, you know, it was, it was, it was quite expensive. It was 21 pence, you know. <laughs> yes, I didn't forget the steaks. You saw her do what to the bra? Fill it. <laughs> With two portions of sirloin. <laughs>honours have become such an institution, they were up for being sent up and made fun of, and not the nine o'clock news. Did a hilarious sketch of two ninnies, Mel and Griff, Mel Smith and Griff Rhys-Jones, as the two ninnies. And there were no double entendres. I can't repeat some of the lines in that sketch. Good evening, it's wonderful to be, it's wonderful to be with you again, isn't it, Ronnie? No, it's a bleeding pain in the ass, frankly. <laughs> but in a packed programme tonight, you'll be reassured to know we'll be using exactly the same sort of material as we've used for the last 20 years. I shall be, I shall be talking incredibly quickly, making spousands of thunerisms and dressing up in women's clothing. And I shan't be getting any laughs because he writes most of the scripts and makes sure I get all the crappy bits. <laughs> Ronnie Barker was furious. Ronnie Corbett told me he sat there watching it and he went, oh, really? And then started laughing. Ronnie Barker sent a very angry letter. There's only one two Ronnies, and that's us. Ronnie Corbett took it in his stride, but Ronnie Barker was... He was furious. Yes. Maybe he felt there was a sense of betrayal by the BBC. They're both BBC shows. The, yeah. the, the, the music in the two Ninnies sketch was written by Pete Brewis, who also wrote for the two Ronnies. So yes. Maybe the betrayal... He felt that like I'd been betrayed. Yes, and maybe he thought, oh, boy, underneath, it's time moving on. Yeah. We are now well, the object of the joke. I think they were getting the end of an era. You comedy, know. comedy was moving forward, and, and that probably was it. Started off to see the palm trees, ended up as two stone dates. Barker was absolutely wonderful at toying with innuendos, and he loved nothing more than to dress up as a woman and sing, either sing or dance, and 
really comic songs. I mean, this is this is his this is musical. This is his musical moment. The big number at the end of any two on his show was the two of them usually dressed up as women quite often singing a song and the song would be one of those classic sort of musical british saucy postcard song i think the one that really stands out for me is the plumstead ladies male voice choir her old man he's the same he's in love with what's her name big jaws droopy drawers standing at the end known to all as man's best friend quite old-fashioned comedy in a way that it sort of recognised there are rude words that you're not supposed to say on television and very nearly saying them. We've got a new milkman, his skin is like silkman, his van's full of goodies he brings round to sell. <laughs> he's full of surprises, he's got eggs of both sizes, he's got half cream and full cream and whipped cream as well. <laughs> health was deteriorating and uh, he confided in Ronnie Corbett that after this next series we're doing that is it I'm retiring and then it came about and he did retire he walked away he was then recalled at the behest of Albert Finney who was playing Winston Churchill and wanted Ronnie Barker's butler Ronnie Barker came out of retirement he admired Albert Finney, and they did the film together. Uh, what time is Mrs. P coming? Early afternoon, sir. Early afternoon? Why not this morning? Because you told her not to come till after lunch, sir. For your invention, I did nothing of the sort. You said you were going to town this morning, sir, so she would not be required until after lunch. Well, I've changed my mind. I need to redraft this speech. Get her here now. Yes, sir. As a result, the director cast him in another film in Italy, and then Ronnie Barker said, that is it and uh, he walked away. I think he was offered false stuff by Peter Hall and said, oh no, not driving into the theater every day in the rush hour. <laughs> really down to earth practical thing. No, I've done that, been there, done that. Sadly for us, Ronnie Barker retired from comedy and entertainment at the age of 58. Rather oddly, he went to run an antique shop in Chipping Norton. He did take a very definite decision to retire really quite early. I didn't know what custom he got. Did people go in and think they've now entered into the world of, a, of, the, of the sketch land? Some of your bits and pieces here, Mr. Barker, are older than some of the jokes he used to do on television. I think he had a sense that he wanted to go out while he was still respected. He may have been right, actually. You know, it may, it may be that his legacy is all the greater for the fact that people don't go, oh, yeah, but he did that thing later that wasn't as good, because there wasn't really anything um, that he did that wasn't good. Maybe he was telling the truth when he said he, he wasn't comfortable uh, in that sense performing and he had to do it to get behind a costume, to get inside a character, and uh, after a while he'd had enough of doing that. the apple in that pocket there, and I've got a beautiful pear in my trouser pocket. <laughs> I think Ronnie Barker's legacy is unique, actually. I don't think there's anybody quite like him, because he's not only a great comic actor, but he was also an incredibly gifted writer. He loved everything about language. He had a verbal dexterity in terms of his delivery, but he had a literary dexterity in terms of his writing. Unbelievable. And now the Wother. Tomorrow's Wother will be what? Oh. <laughs> Oh, we'll be what? We'll be what? <laughs> Ronnie Barker is one of those people that uh, my generation admire enormously. He was one of those people that wasn't flamboyant. He was just down to earth. But when he did his performance, they're so well done. And watch it, you just think, gosh, you're brilliant. Oh, no, no, I'm never the worse for drink, no. I'm sometimes the better for it. <laughs> Ronnie Barker's legacy is a kind of comedy which is infrequent but essential on British television. 
It's the kind of comedy which is set in a particular place and a particular time, really lacerates something silly, plays with words, plays with ideas, and tells a form of truth about our lives. And it's something that's become, if you like, a theme in British comedy ever since. So what was she like? I mean, what sort of girl? A French bread. Oh. <laughs> I would describe him as more inspirational than influential. He was someone that inspired people to want to be in comedy in terms of just that sort of joy of performing and of making people laugh. I, I think you just sort of thought, I'd like to be like that. That's all we've got time for this evening, so it's good night from me. And it's good night from him. Good night. Good night. Good night. Ian Hedge may look like a humble council worker, but he is also a superhero, solving crimes with good intentions and total incompetence. Starring one of my favourites, Kevin Eldon, Brilliant Man is available now on demand. I'm Katie Brand for Sky Arts. Mm -hmm.